Hello, my name is Alison and I'm the Information Officer for the Highlands for the National Autistic Society Scotland. And my role is to give information and advice about autism to parents, carers and professionals in the Highlands. One of the topics that I get asked about quite frequently is to do with autism and bereavement and grief because this can be especially challenging for autistic children um, and children and young people with other neurodevelopmental differences too. So I thought it might be useful just to give an overview of some information which might help you if you're support supporting a child or family through a grief or bereavement situation. So what I'm going to cover is to give a bit more information about autism and what it means to be autistic and then to give some information about diagnosis and what happens in Highland before looking a bit more at bereavement support. What is autism? This is information from the National Autistic Society. So autism is a developmental disability which affects how a person communicates with and relates to other people and how they experience the world around them. Autism is lifelong, so an autistic child will become an autistic adult. And it's a spectrum condition, which means all autistic people, like all people, are different. And essentially, autism is just a difference. And like everyone, autistic people too are all unique and they have their own likes, dislikes, talents, challenges, dreams and ambitions. Here's a bit more information about autism. Autism is a hidden disability. You won't know that the person you're talking to is autistic, but it is actually quite common. The National Autistic Society figure is that more than one in 100 people are autistic, but actually it's thought to be much higher than that. Of the autistic community, four in 10 have a learning disability, which of course means that six in 10 do not have a learning disability. And you might be aware that boys are more often diagnosed than girls. Some autistic people might be non-verbal. They'll need another means of communication. And for some families, there's a genetic link, but not in all families. And the idea of a cure can be deeply distressing for autistic people and their families who celebrate their autistic difference. And people learn strategies to succeed. Autism is a lifelong condition, but people learn strategies to get jobs and be successful. And throughout history, many autistic people have made a huge difference to our society. And you might be aware that there is lots of different terminology to do with autism. You might have heard of, heard of Asperger's syndrome, high functioning autism, but generally the term autistic is preferred. Just to give you some information about diagnosis in Highland. So for children, the diagnostic pathway is through the child's plan to the NDAS system. That's the Neurodevelopmental Assessment Service. And that can also diagnose things like ADHD and DCD. For adults, diagnosis can be made through the Highland One Stop Shop, which is a service run by Autism Initiatives or by a referral to a GP but both the routes for children and adults have really long delays. So the child or adult that you might be seeing might be autistic, but not diagnosed. But to have a diagnosis of autism, there will be challenges with three specific areas, social communication and interaction, sensory issues, and routines and repetition, including dealing with change. And you might well also see big issues with anxiety and there might be an additional diagnosis, such as ADHD. And I'll go along to talk a bit more about those three areas on the next slides. So the first, first area of difference for diagnosis is social communication and interaction. And all autistic people are different, but the person might have specific difficulties understanding idioms. So something like it's raining cats and dogs can be really difficult for an autistic person to understand. They might also find it difficult to understand facial expressions and body language. And they might find it difficult in things like a game to know when to take their turn. Many autistic people have huge special interests, which can be a great strength, but they might find it difficult to know when to stop talking about their special interest. 
They might find it difficult to process information quickly, and they may find it difficult to make eye contact, but that's not true for all autistic people. But they might well find it difficult to understand emotions, both in themselves and, others, and in others, and to understand other people's points of view. The second area for diagnosis is sensory sensitivities. And some autistic people can be over or under sensitive in their senses. And this can change depending on their level of anxiety and depending on different days. Somebody who is oversensitive might not like bright lights or sounds. They might not like to be touched and might not like strong flavours or smells. But somebody who is undersensitive might love bright lights and loud music. They may, might love deep pressure such as a big hug or might love strong flavours or smells. The third area for diagnosis is to do with routines, repetition and change. And change can be really difficult for many autistic people. So changing a familiar routine can be really distressing. For instance, a child who uses the same route to get to school in the car could be very upset if the journey needs to be changed because of roadworks. Autistic people may need to know exactly when an activity will start and finish. And you might see rituals and repetitive behaviour to support anxiety. For example, some autistic children might like to watch the same DVD over and over again. And autistic people might become distressed by unfamiliar events, situations and people. And some may resist any new experiences because not knowing what to expect is just too scary. And this all makes a bereavement especially challenging for autistic people. So autistic people can experience many challenges. And when it all becomes too much, the autistic person might not be able to cope anymore and might have a meltdown. Just as all autistic people are different, meltdowns can be really different too. So some people can be very quiet and others might cry or seem upset. But the important thing to recognise is that autistic meltdowns aren't a form of misbehaviour. They're the response to a challenging environment or circumstance. One more thing you might like to be aware about, particularly if you're talking to autistic women or girls, is to do with masking. And autistic females can be really good at masking meaning that you won't see the true behaviour and emotions. I think this is a really powerful image from an artist called Rosanna Rossetti. I've learned to how, hide how my autism affects me. So autistic people may have lots of challenges, but they may have lots of strengths too. Autism gives a really unique view of the world. And some of the strengths that you might see are things like attention to detail, deep focus and concentration, and really great observational skills. An autistic person might well have a really good knowledge of a special interest, and they might be analytical, methodical, creative, and inventive. They may be very determined and accepting of difference, both in themselves and others. And they may be very honest, which is a great strength. And throughout history, many great minds are thought to have been autistic, so people like Darwin, Einstein, Mozart, Michelangelo, and more recently, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. We'll go on now to look at the specific challenges with bereavement and grief that you might see with an autistic child. So the first thing to say is that bereaved autistic children might not respond in a typical way. You might find a child laughing, for instance, in a situation where you might have thought they would cry. And bereavement might not just be of a, a death, but it could be of something like losing an object such as a special toy, or of a situation like moving house, parents divorcing, or perhaps dad goes away for periods of time for work. Autistic children might well be developmentally younger and may not understand language or emotions in themselves and others, or have words to express themselves. And you might not know how they are coping. Remember that autistic girls particularly are very good at masking. So looking at their behaviour might be key to how things really are going. 
And as we've said, change for autistic people is really hard and any kind of bereavement is a huge change. We'll move on now to look at some practical ways that you could help. The first thing is to prepare. If you're a professional, ask a parent or carer about the young person. Ask about how they like to communicate things. Ask about their level of understanding and their experience of situations. What happened there? And if you're a parent, carer or professional, prepare in other ways. Prepare for the loss in advance if you can. And if, for instance, the young person is going to go and see Granny in hospital, prepare them for what Granny will look like. Will she be lying in a bed? What will she be wearing? Will there be machines around her? If you're talking to an autistic child, think about your language and keep it simple and literal. Use terms like died, not passed away, so that they'll understand what you're talking about. And if you're in a, in a conversation, give the autistic child time to respond. Remember that their processing will be slower. Be prepared to repeat information many times to help understanding. And if you are repeating things, use the same words again and again. And explain what's happening now and next to the child. Where there's a routine in place, help to maintain that as much as you can. That will really help anxiety. And for everything, use visuals such as images and visual timetables, because autistic people are often visual learners. Grief and bereavement are all about emotions. So support the autistic child to learn about emotions, both in themselves and others. And where you can, give control. So for instance, if, if you're having a meeting with a young person, let them choose where they're going to sit. That will help reduce their anxiety. Give them control about things like the funeral if you can. Can they decide whether they would like to go? And help them support the implications of the loss. The fact that Granny has died might not immediately mean for them that Granny will not be at their birthday party at the weekend. Help them to understand what it means for them. And thinking about things like memory boxes, which are a great way to remember somebody. Think about the fact that the autistic child might be a sensory learner. Could you have things like a perfumed hanky in there to help them to remember the special person? Visual resources to help a situation are really good for autistic people. As I said, they are often visual learners. So for instance, for a young child, you might use photos. For instance, a photo of flowers that are alive and dead to explain what happens. You could use toys. The toys here are from a company called Good Grief Toys. But you could also use dolls or Lego or Playmobil to explain a situation. And for an older child, you might use a model of grief. This one, for instance, shows that you can move between different situations and states of feeling. Here are a few more ideas to help, particularly if you are a professional talking to a bereaved young person or somebody who's experienced a big change. First of all, if you're having a meeting with them in a room, just be aware of the environment, the lights and sounds. Perhaps you might be able to move somewhere that's quieter, or if you're talking to them, perhaps you might have some fiddle toys, such as a squeezy ball that they could hold. And it's really important to use appropriate communication methods for that young person. If you can, talk to the parent or carer who knows them best to understand more about how they like to communicate. And then you might use things like a talking mat as a tool to help. A simple silicon mood band can be really helpful for some autistic young people. You simply flip it between red or green, depending on whether you would like to talk to somebody else or not. Or the autistic young person might find things like a five point scale really helpful, or they might like to communicate using pictures, stories and videos. And something that can be really helpful for bereavement situations is social stories. And I'll go on to give a couple of examples of those. This is an example of a social story. So social stories are written to illustrate specific social situations and how people deal with that situation. And they're really best written for the particular child or young person and the situation that they're in. 
to reinforce what is happening and what will happen. This one, however, is quite a general story. So it says that most people are alive and healthy and have pictures of somebody who is alive and healthy and of a flower that's died. And it then goes on to say that some people can die and why they might die and that they won't come back and that the special person is not coming back. And that makes the person sad, but that's OK and it's OK to cry. So it's reinforcing that situations are OK. And this is an example of a different social story of going to visit someone who's ill in hospital. And here you could fill in the blanks to say the child's name and who's ill and what's going to happen in terms of who's going with them to hospital and what the person will look like. If you're needing any support with social stories, have a look on the Pines website because we've got information there and videos that can help you to write a social story of your own. So I mentioned the Pines website in terms of looking for information on social stories, but there's lots more information on the Pines website too and on our YouTube channel. For instance, Talking Mats is a great way of communication and there's a video about that on the Pines website, plus lots of other information about things like supporting a child through change. You might also like to look at the Change, Loss and Bereavement website and their blog, which are excellent and have loads of ideas to support children and young people. And finally, if you'd like to understand more about autism, please do look at the National Autistic Society website. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions, please get in touch with me at highland.informationofficer at nas.org.uk.